Ó, oh, de Berlim! Olha, temos o, temos o Samuel Guess, né? Já estou a ligar. Olá, Samuel! Olá, Catarina! Olhem, um, está, estamos, estamos na hora, portanto são 5 da tarde um, e vamos começar este seminário uh, de Cultura Material da Ciência, organizado pelo Museu Nacional de História Natural e da Ciência desde 2007 e é, pretende ser um espaço, aliás eu acho que é o único espaço uh, digital ou não digital, começou por ser presencial e depois o ano passado passamos para o digital, mas penso que é o único espaço onde se debatem questões relacionadas, metodológicas algumas, teóricas outras, relacionadas com collections-based research, portanto, tudo o que tem a ver com cultura material e como é que, qual é a relação e a dinâmica que a cultura material estabelece, não só com as práticas da ciência, mas também ah, com as ideias da ciência. E, portanto, este é o seminário deste mês, são todos, os, todos os meses acontece um seminário, uh, tipicamente à última segunda-feira de cada mês, e, uh, e, portanto, hoje é a última segunda-feira de abril, e, portanto, temos o prazer de ter connosco Bruno Martinho, uh, que eu vou apresentar, que vai fazer, a sua, uh, o, vai fazer o seu seminário em inglês, em língua inglesa, Uh, e que, portanto, eu vou apresentar em língua inglesa também. So, Bruno, thank you so much for being here. Let me introduce you. Um, you are curator at the National Palace of Sintra in Portugal. And in 2018, you completed a PhD at the European University Institute in Florence. The project he developed was focused on the consumption of non-European objects in the Iberian Peninsula during the second half of the 16th century. He also holds a, deg a first degree in history from the University of Lisbon and a MA in museum studies at the University College from the University College London and a second MA, wow, very good, in history of art at Nova University in Lisbon. From 2010 to 2014, Bruno Martin was curator at the National Palace of Pena in Sintra, Palacio Nacional da Pena in Sintra. And previously, he worked as documentation officer for the Ministry of Education in Portugal. His interests in museums led him to participate in two summer schools at the Ecole du Louvre in Paris in 2008 and 2016 and to organize an international workshop about curating history in Florence, 2017, which I had the absolute honor and pleasure, delight of participating. So it was a fantastic workshop. It really made history. And so today we, you're here with us to do this seminar and the topic, the theme, the, 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 the object of your seminar is a fantastic globe that still lots of people do not know about. So they will learn possibly uh, about for the first time um, here today. And it is the Schisler globe. Schisler is the name of a person he will explain, I hope. And globe is a globe, a normal globe, a celestial globe. And he's going to talk about the relations between objects and their spaces the spaces they occupy during their life cycles using this example of this fantastic globe as a point of departure. So thank you so much, Bruno, for being with us. And uh, yeah, and um, the connection is good. People are aware, everyone is listening, thousands of viewers waiting for you. Tell us, tell well, thank us, you. let's start. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Martha. Thank you very much for this uh, for this uh, introduction. Um, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been following the all the videos that uh, the museum has been organizing during the past, especially during the pandemic crisis, which was always very nice to to see and follow. So I'm very glad to be here today and to well present a bit of what I've been working on and to see 
also to have the opportunity to have your feedback, which is uh, the best uh, thing of these uh, seminars. So I'm going to try to share my presentation. So I hope you can see it. Um, so I'm going to talk about this fantastic object. So following a post-enlightenment practice, many museums today still tend to organize knowledge around categories, whether in art museums or natural history museums, objects are often and still arranged according to classifications of knowledge that are defined by their disciplines of study. So we still have the galleries with the Gothic paintings or the Baroque furniture, the African mammals over here or the Asian birds over there. However, most historic palaces or other heritage sites such as archeological fields do mix objects hoping to lead visitors to have more holistic experiences. How those holistic experiences are conceived and implemented is the biggest challenge of curators in heritage sites, since the object always needs to relate to the site itself, a site that can overwhelm the visitor and even suppress the object. Therefore, the object which has its own history must compete with the space. In this championship, the object's historical complexity is often sidelined. In fact, it is not rare to have objects just as illustrations of ideas or presented as mere props in historical reconstructions. In this championship between object and site, the object is commonly the loser. So how can we address the historical complexity of an object within the limitations of the overarching narrative of the exhibition in which it is displayed? This is a question that Deborah Radiobald and myself have raised a few years ago in that conference in Florence, but the challenge still stands. In this talk, I focus on the Schistler Globe at the National Palace of Sintra to discuss the implications of the decision about the place where it belongs in the exhibition. So let's start with the object. So, and here we go. So the object at the core of this presentation is a gilt copper globe depicting the celestial sphere with representations of constellations and the signs of the zodiac. It was made by Christopher Schisler, the elder, in 1575 in Augsburg, and is one of the few 16th century celestial globes to have survived to this day. Schisler was one of the most important makers of instruments, machinery, and automatons in the city of Augsburg, where he created countless instruments for the courts of Vienna, Prague, and Dresden. Schisler's celestial globe, which probably had a terrestrial counterpart, now unfortunately lost, was a scientific instrument, a collector's item, and a testimony of a courtly interest in cosmography, astronomy, and astrology during the Renaissance period all over Europe. Samuel Gessner, who has thoroughly studied this globe, made a biography of the object, characterizing a three-stage life. So first, according to Gessner, the object was used as a scientific instrument by astronomers or scholars. But as all scientific instruments, it became outdated. So it was possibly discarded at some point. Uh, and since it's lost, it lost its scientific function, it still preserved some symbol symbolic meaning to be kept possibly as part of a Kunstkammer. So it survived its obsolescence as a collectible. Finally, it was then rescued from oblivion at the turn of the 20th century when it became a museum object, a relic to be adored for its rarity. As Gessner demonstrated throughout its 450 years life, this globe was used and perceived differently across time. However, in his article, Gessner also recognized that a luxurious object such as the Schisler globe at the end of the 16th century was not just a scientific instrument. It was also, and perhaps mainly, a consumable for a high-ranking consumer rather than a scholar. So we start to see here a parallel story for the, uh, the item. So the object was not just a scientific object, it was also an item to enhance the splendor of a wealthy or high-ranking consumer. 
a reason that could have well lasted into the 17th century or until it eventually integrated the museum. Yet, alternatively, it can also be assumed that there were other parallel stories or the parallel layers to the globe. And one of them could be that the globe was used um, as an attribute to represent a certain idea or to convey a certain message. In this case, the globe became a prop as to, word, to use the words uh, by Giorgio Riel who characterized this, the uses of material culture. In fact, the Schissel globe continued to be used as a prop in such a way uh, up until recently. For example, in 2017, it integrated a massive exhibition at the Kremlin Museums in Moscow, where it stood to attest the contribution of Portuguese expansion and navigation to the history of humankind. So how can we tackle this complexity? How can we tackle all these parallel and subsequent stories within the narrative of an exhibition? That is the question. Let's look now at the exhibition space. The globe is today part of the collection of the National Palace of Sintra in Portugal. This is a building that has been inhabited, adapted, extended and transformed over the course of a millennium. Like the Schisler globe, it has been used and interpreted in many different ways over time, which poses, of course, a major challenge for curators and visitors alike. The, this, the palace's complexity is at the core of a current transformation of its permanent exhibition. Rather than a focus on decorative arts or historical figures, the new narrative that is being created focuses on concepts that address problems common to diverse times and areas of the building. The building features of each architectural unit were the points of departure to choose concepts that address transversal problems and stories of the building. So what we have now is that each architectural unit focuses on a different concept and have power, units dedicated to power, identity, memory, authority, and so on. In this conceptual approach, storytelling takes pride of place. And in line with this, the Schistler globe actually belongs almost everywhere in the narrative. It can be regarded as an instrument to map space, so it fits in the unit dedicated to space, as well as an instrument to convey a position of power. It also stands as a relic of the past and an item to construct collective memory. It defined the identity of the, the, its creator as it can convey an image of authority of some of its users. Yet it can still act as a symbol in political negotiations. So how can we choose the space without excluding all the other layers, all the diversity of stories of the object? Where can we place it? Now, since being a scientific instrument is one of its most distinguishable features, and this is something that occurred mainly at the beginning of the object's life, we better start with the end of the 16th century. As we have seen, we have here at least three different layers of meaning. But to cope with this, we must return the scientific object back to its place. A few years ago, David Livingston drew our attention to the importance of considering the spatiality of science. Framed by what we today call the spatial, the spatial turn, Livingston aimed at putting science back in its place. His claim was that the sites where science is produced, the cultures among which science is produced, and the way in which knowledge circulates all contribute to define the type of science that is produced. Within all these forces, the exact site where science was produced from the laboratory to the monastery had pride of place. So following on Livingston, space does matter. In the Portuguese case, for example, scientific production at the end of the 16th century cannot be understood without merchants, imperial bureaucrats, high-ranking consumers, apothecaries, physicians, sailors, and diplomats. The work of Antonio Barrera Osorio, Cañizares Esguerra, or Enrique Leitão have thoroughly demonstrated that in 15th and 16th century Iberia, geography, intellectual networks, 
and commercial connections were closely intertwined and that the production of knowledge was highly dependent on demand. The demand from maritime industry determined the development of scientific instruments. The demand for drugs from consumers that determined the evaluation and study of the natural world. The demand for goods and imperial expansion determined the development of cartography. So the production of knowledge is therefore intrinsically related with consumption as well as with social and political power. So where in the palace can we address this complexity of the scientific production? Well, perhaps in the wardrobe. If we search for scientific instruments in early modern inventories, one of the places where we are going to find them is in the wardrobe. In the inventory of the Duke of Berganza from 1564-67, scientific instruments such as astrolabes and clocks were kept in the wardrobe together with clothes, jewels, items for hunting, silverware, and furniture. The list of items could almost suggest this room was some sort of wunderkammer or cabinet of curiosities, but this was no such thing. There is plenty of literature about the creation of collections for study in Europe during the 16th and 17th centuries. The existence of studioli in Italy, but also in France or the Holy Roman Empire has been well investigated. In Portugal, for example, at the beginning of the 15th century, King Duarte already mentioned the existence of a room called Trescamera, where the lord of the palace would withdraw to read and think. However, the Trescamera, which seemed to suggest a studiolo, is not mentioned in later sources. There is also plenty of literature on the development of cabinets of curiosity during the 17th century, where there was a systematic organization of naturalia and artificialia. Here, for example, there is the case of Ferrante Imperato in Naples. Another famous example is Olive Worm in Copenhagen. But again, there is no reference to such a type of room in Portuguese sources. Still, another reference is, for example, the gallery of Cornelius van der Geest that shows an organization of items that tend to almost be encyclopedic. Structure around painting, scientific instruments, porcelain, and many other things, this type of room defines what is usually called a Kunstkammer. However, the wardrobe is a different type of thing. The wardrobe was an intimate room within the noble apartment where access and we see it at the, at the end of the apartment. So it was an intimate room where access was very restricted. It could be used to receive distinct uh, guests as a cabinet of curiosity as well, but it could be used also to read or study, but this was not its major function. The wardrobe in the Iberian Peninsula takes several names. It is often called either a trascamera, recamera, camarin, guardaropa, well, but regardless of the name, what they have in common is their capacity to dazzle and the financial value of the, what's in them. One of the earliest reference to this type of room was made by St. Teresa of Avila, which, who described the Camerine, uh, Camerine in 1577. And I quote, suppose you enter a room, a Camerine, uh, as I think it is called, of a king or some great lord, where is a great variety of several kinds of things of crystal glasses, porcelain, and many other vessels placed in such order that on entering, they're almost all seen. I was once conducted into such a room in the house of the Duchess of Alba. When I entered the room, I was amazed, thinking what could be the use of such a variety of things. Now, though I remained there for a short time, such abundance was to be seen that I immediately forgot everything and I no more remembered all the vases that if I had never seen them, nor could I tell what shape they were, but only in general, I remember having seen them." End of quote. So St. Teresa describes here a porcelain and glass camarin, which was usually a feminine room, but men also had camarines. And in the case, for example, of the Duke of Braganza or the Duke of Lerma, there were many other items beyond ceramics. There were jewels and textiles, for example. But in both cases, both male and female Camerinians, the impact of the whole cam is clearly much more significant than the features of individual objects. The Baraunda 
that Teresa de Avila mentions in her sources, that, that is the pell-mell of ceramic and glass and just suppose in the same room, created a dazzled and overwhelming reaction. And rather than the wonder or exoticness of individual items, Saint Teresa describes a place of conspicuous and lavish consumption. This hypothesis is confirmed by the inventories. What inventories reveal is that camarines as guardarropas were one of the main financial assets of the noble house. Their contents were not organized according to an encyclopedic criteria. Instead, they were intended to dazzle and to be sold in the case of financial need. So in fact, the contents of camarinas and wardrobes were part of a consumption behavior determined by the need of social manifestation, the need to manifest one's splendor. In the National Palace of Sintra, there is also a wardrobe where the Schistler globe can be displayed. And here comes the championship between object and sight. So the sight is the wardrobe, which is within a unit dedicated to the power, to the concept of power. But within the wardrobe, we need to reveal all the layers of the objects from being a scientific instrument, but as well as a splendid object. Besides, it was an attribute of power, as we have just seen, but it still is a museum object. So let's try to put all these pieces and bits together. Start with the globe. So when displayed, the object needs a, some sort of supporting installation or mounting to allow an understanding of its function as a scientific object, and hence the importance of a stand and the circle of the horizon. Then we need other objects, not only to understand the function of the site as a wardrobe, but to understand the globe as an item of conspicuous and splendid consumption. In this regard, the scientific function of the object is balanced by its role as a consumable good. Then we need a plinth or a showcase to enhance its role as a museum object, rather than something that is laying there to be used. And this means we add a contemporary layer to the item. Now, we also need to include all the other layers, the ones that I just mentioned before. We can do it manually with lots of texts and pictures, or you can do it digitally through our smartphones. The important aspect of this, of all this information that we're going to provide is that the contents should be more than just interpretation or mediation of the object. The content should be material to enhance the production of knowledge within the space of the exhibition. The visitor should be allowed to produce their own understanding, their own knowledge about the object and to see that knowledge later integrated as part of the object's complexity. So in other words, if we provide them with information about the history of the item, the biography, where it stood. Um, we, can, we can also provide more content. It should be used as a, as a raw material information. We can provide, for example, all the information about the different users and the, the biography of the item, where it went through, uh, or for example, um, how it was used originally. Um, when not just as a type of informative aspect, but also uh, as a, a way to create to be able to create a comparison, for example, between earlier uh, ways of navigation uh, to different ways of navigation in contemporary societies. So, making a comparison between navigating to, with the sky, with the skies or with GPS. Now, all these layers. Um, it's, be, besides all these layers, the complexity of the object is also defined by the countless perceptions and understandings that each single visitor makes of the globe. Therefore, if our ambition is to display the historical complexity of the, the object, we cannot attain the same without including the possibilities for visitors to give feedback about the item. That feedback should then be integrated in the exhibition itself and enrich the object display. So to conclude, the difficulty of deciding where an object belongs 
comes from the acceptance of the idea that by placing an object in a given site, in a given place, that location is going to limit our understanding. So we always need to decide what is the most appropriate uh, space, what is the exact location. Um, but perhaps this reasoning is also the result of the fact that we still see museums as inherently physical and material. We still believe that the physicality of objects and museums are determinant for our comprehension of objects. So despite all the Despite all its negative impact, the current pandemic crisis has also challenged us to think museums and heritage sites differently. On the one hand, heritage sites remain close for the last, for most of the last year, but on the other hand, curators and museum staff have also been forced to rethink about the definition of museum and how to engage with the collections. Accessibility, participation, and social inclusion tend to be now as important for these institutions as conservation, education, or fruition. The digital uh, transition is leading us to leave back the constraints of physicality and to look to the immense world of possibilities in the museum experience. The digital age might well be an opportunity for museums to fully engage with the historical complexity of objects and to go beyond its physicality. After all, and despite everything that I've just talked about, the Schistler globe does not belong anywhere, not even to the wardrobe. The Schistler globe, like all objects, has gone through spaces and from site to site. Eventually, it's this immaterial complexity that really challenges the museums of today. So thank you very much for your attention. Stop sharing. Wow, fantastic talk, uh, Bruno, really. really. You, ha you have no idea how active we've been in the chat because Samuel is uh, there, Katarina is there, Deborah is there, Paulo Breni is there listening to you. Yeah. No, really, it's amazing. And so, yeah, I mean, I have so many questions, but I will first give the, um, the precedence to our audience. Let's see, there were several discussions. You can also open your YouTube and see that there's a lot of stuff. Fantastic, great, thanks. This was fantastic. Yeah, okay, so these are the comments. Basically, we were discussing two things. There is no question, you know, formally mm -hmm. uh, made yet, but we were discussing two things. First, the concept of wardrobe, which excited us very much. And the parallel that you make, not only with other, with uh, the Studiolo and, um, uh, the Teresa Davila Camerina, Camerina, Camerin, 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 ah, Camerin, okay, got it. So I love the Barafunda thing. So no, Barahunda, Barahunda is yeah, Spanish, it's right? Spanish in origin. Yeah, 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 fantastic. And so, yeah, okay, so first the concept of wardrobe, we were kind of, we didn't understand very well if it's the same as the idea that we have today, a place where they would get dressed or undressed. So a more private space. But then when you mentioned all the whole idea of, of, you know, where they would put objects that were, that had splendor and where you would manifest one splendor. So I got a bit confused about the nature, private versus public consumption. Yeah, consumption because it was clothes and textiles and objects of daily life or their, their, their daily life. So can you explore a little bit more? What is a wardrobe? What did you have in mind in a wardrobe? Historically, obviously. And then also the place of the Sintra wardrobe in that broader context. Could you help us out? Yeah, the, the, the wardrobe is a, uh, is a difficult concept even because it's, it's never very clear what exactly exactly it is. It doesn't seem that there is a close definition. Now, what we see is that for the early modern period, it's difficult to create a separation between private and public because the, the whole social structure, um, the two things are brought together. 
what we know is that the wardrobe is the last room in the sequence of rooms that go from a more accessible to a more restrict um, enfilade or at least a selection. So it's really about um, setting uh, boundaries between one room and the other, which means that not everyone can reach the last stage of the, um, of the sequence. So it's not so much about private, it's I would say perhaps more intimate because yeah. it's more strict. Um, but obviously the king or the nobleman could receive within in the wardrobe. What that would mean is that the person who would receive would be someone of a very high uh, rank. ranking. So yeah. we're talking about either card or family, or family, or family, or family, exactly. Or family. Exactly. Okay. So that is one of the things. So it's it's really make, makes this room very special, and very distinct. Um, now it's it seems that it develops from some some types of medieval treasure chambers. Yeah, it's like the, the the treasure, the idea of treasure, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's very related. It's very related to um, to this idea of the property, like the physical property of the noble house. Something that okay, these are my this is other things that if uh, I, I'm in a financial need, I can sell in order to have the means either to survive or to support my household. Um, so, and that's whereas that might have changed in our, in Central Europe, in towards a more like a, almost a display space. Some yeah, where you here it seems that it never lost that primordial function of some. Yeah where you keep your treasures, where you keep your yeah, important yeah. things. Um, so Paolo is saying guardaroba in Italian. So it's much more than it, it is now. It's, the concept is much yeah. wider than it is now. Um, so, so you yeah. would... Yeah, go on, go on. And, and I, I would say I would say that that was one of the things that was really difficult to map these places is that you see that you don't have two that look the same. Uh, some yeah. can be more, and this even with the camarines that we see that, for, for example, in female apartments, it tends to be more ceramics, whereas in male apartments tend to be more mixed. Um, but then they use different words and it really depends on the, on the periods. Um, but it seems that they all go into the same direction, that idea of the guardaroba, no? where you, you keep your clothes, you keep your yeah. textiles, which is always very yeah. important. Yeah. But but then it's a bit flexible. Yeah. What you do it. So, and you, how do we know this? We know it because of inventories. So they would describe what's the content of the guardaroba wardrobe. Yeah. Guard, how is the origin in Portuguese? What's the name of the in? For well, the 16th century, you have guardaroba. Guardaroba. Okay. And and you and usually the things are kept not on display because you see that everyone is kept in chests. So this oh. is something that you see that well, how is it used then? Because it's not the, the idea of a kunstkammer and the cabinet of curiosities that we have in no. mind. That they, so even the barahunda that Teresa the Abel mentions, it seems that everyone is like piled up, <laughs> right? But then actually on display. Um, and the, the number of chests in these wardrobes are enormous. And it seems that all the scientific objects are kept within all the, the stuff in the chests. Yeah, yeah. So you, you find plausible that uh, assuming that this globe was there, okay, because we are not certain of that. Anyway, you already mentioned that, but assuming that the, 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 the globe, the Schisla globe was there, its location would be, it's plausible that it would be in the wardrobe. That's, I think, your argument, right? Yeah, yes, I think so. I don't, I, especially for the 15th, 16th century, then again, as Gessner said in his article, then it may, it changes its yeah. function. So we have no idea what, uh, well, we don't even know if it was in Portugal at this time or not. It's, it's really, yeah. but yeah. what we see is that most, Scientific instruments tend to be tend to be kept in the wardrobe. Yeah, so at least yeah, for this yeah. until the beginning of the 17th century, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Um, what kind, Deborah? Deborah asks. Hi, Deborah. 
what kind of archival material is available to document the place of the globe? Um, I imagine it, she refers to the 16th century or transversal. And I mean, what we have two types of sources. So the first one is inventories, of course, and it's always the most useful one. Uh, but then what you have about this globe in specific doesn't allow us to go back uh, before the, the 19th century. Um, what we have for the palace to understand how spaces function, we have descriptions. Uh, so we have uh, some, some treatises for the 15th century what meant, that mentions how uh, an apartment should be organized. So we, you understand what's the relation of space and function. Um, and then we have small bits and pieces here and there that mention specific rooms. So I'm talking, I'm thinking about correspondence in the 16th century when these rooms can be created. But again, it's never something very specific to, to this or that palace. You can only like bring together uh, plans, building plans, correspondence, uh, treatises, uh, some uh, vi descriptions of uh, visits to places, but you can never do it to one single uh, building. You have to connect all these pieces and bits from different buildings in the Iberian Peninsula because it thinks it, 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 it works on the same way between Portugal and, and Spain to kind of understand what is plausible, to use the word that Marta was using, to understand what is plausible. Um, because you can never, it's we don't have enough sources to connect this globe in specific to that. Sure, state. sure, 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 sure. But let's forget plausibility, because in the exhibition we can have alternative narratives, for example, based on function, and we can, you know, inflame the imagination of visitors as long as we're authentic truthful to the history, as long as you, you know, you say, we don't know if it was here, so and so, blah, 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 you can advance uh, a narrative. And so Samuel asks, if you plan to have a hierarchy of location within the wardrobe, so like, the, let me see how he, he, let me use his exact words. Do you, do you aim at having a hierarchy among the various objects in the wardrobe space? Will the Schisler globe be a star object or one of several ones? We, we talked about this with a, with a showcase. The showcase is a very particular uh, thing <laughs> because if you put all the objects together, then so there's always something that's going to catch the eye, no? Either because it's the largest object in the room or it's the one that has the best light on it. Um, so if you struggle with it, I mean, the globe is quite large for a globe of the 16th century, but still it's not the largest uh, object in the room. So obviously a tapestry or, or a piece of furniture would always um, overshadow the object. But then if you put a plinth and a showcase, there you have it. You have the relic, you have the rarity. So it becomes almost automatically. Uh, and obviously in this room, the Schisla globe deserves to be the star. Uh, we have a couple of other things, but the globe deserves to be the star. So then of course you're playing here. Uh, again, it's, not a, it's never a, recon a reconstruction of the space because you're the one who's saying, no, 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 this is more important than that. So yeah, I yeah, want you to yeah. look at this, not at that. Yeah. Uh, so obviously there is, there is the curatorial side. You're just uh, yeah. guiding the visitor to where you... It's choices. It's about choices. You are indeed ch selecting, you know, by, first of all, having it uh, or not having it. Then the lightning, then, you know, the level of... Um, the relation that it established with other objects, the, the, the your placement and so on. So you're always making choices and they're very difficult, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, but, um, but it seems wonderful, except that it doesn't have a stand, the globe. So you will have to imagine a stand. Uh, I was, yeah, you did you, how did you? Samuel suggested it. And uh, I, th I think it would be important. 
but obviously you can always complement it with something else. And that's why the digital uh, aspect of the exhibition is so important. Uh, and, and while I was preparing this talk, I was thinking, no, the digital should not be seen as um, a complement or something that you add to the exhibition. It really should be seen as part of the exhibition because when you go, well, everywhere now we take our smartphones and we're always checking stuff. And if we don't have enough information, we just go on Wikipedia and to check yeah. more information. Yeah. So yeah. It's already part of our, of our experience anyway. Um, so we really should embrace it and try to, to make the exhibition more complete uh, yeah. by, by integrating all the possibilities that um, the digital solutions can add to the Augmented, the my God, it's augmented reality. That's what this asks for, totally, yeah. totally. It's great because people can even see the globe spinning, you know, they can see all sorts of things. And uh, we should do a project uh, to, to develop this. Uh -huh. Because in this case, augmented reality really offers a, a huge potential, not only to, to add the stand, if you don't, because it's true that now it has this very cute uh, donut when it stands. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it's the best solution. Elma Sogra, Elma Sogra. Yeah. Isn't it? It's where you put, uh, you know, yeah. hot things. So it's a, a donut made of tissue, velvet, I think it's I remember. Like it's like velvet where you place it. But it's really, but it's amazing. I love the, the, the Sagra, you know, I think you should uh, get rid of it. Yeah, in terms of conservation, it's perfect. But of, of course, if you want to have the reading of the object as a scientific yeah. Factor, yeah. yeah, that yeah. augmented reality really could bring the object to life. And it's also the fact that it's a very difficult object to observe in natural, yeah. well, because the yeah. engraving is not very clear. You really, and it depends on the lightning, the lightning that you have. So if you have, an augmented reality, obviously, you can always focus on some specific details of the item, and you can go. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, Samuel is asking, okay, all that digital material resources, will they be, virtual um, augmented reality, will they be made available for pre-museum or post-museum experience, or both? You think? Uh, What's your plan? Well, not really, because the plan is not developed. This is more like an open field for discussion. <laughs> but it's a good question. It's fact that on, in, I think it makes sense to use it on site while you're watching it, because you're engaging yeah. with it and you're thinking about it. And you can just you can just do this, and you're seeing yeah. different things in your. Mm -hmm. But obviously, there are always constraints about the the place, the amount of people that are in the room. So you, yeah, perhaps yeah, you cannot yeah. stay as long as you want. So you can develop different solutions for different purposes. And obviously you can mm -hmm. make available preparatory material that you release online. Um, and this is something that we've been investing a lot during the past year, no? to, to prepare your mm -hmm. visit online. Um, yeah. And then you just go in and go with very specific aims to the exhibition. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a good question. It's, it's a question to think of. Okay, what's the purpose of each single solution? What right, yeah. right. And Deborah asks. I think it has more to do with the debate we were having about the multiple places where objects have been and the concepts of different places. She she asks. So the staging of the globe, the choice that you make as a curator today, sort of mirrors the many different places in the way that the information is drawn from the, from the description of these places, right? A sort of imagined museum. Can you comment on that? It's not a question, it's really a comment. What do you think? It's an attempt to do it. <laughs> I'm not, Absolutely. But, but I think that's the aim, no? It's uh, the, the Malho project of creating this imagined museum with all the information together. Um, yeah, I didn't think about Malco while I was <laughs> thinking about this, but yes, yeah, I think yeah, it's, yeah. It's, the, it's the same the same aim, is to try to bring all the information together, um, almost as, a, um, as an archive uh, yeah. of, the, of the object. Uh, and then obviously it's on the visitor to choose what's the material and information that yeah. wants to, to have access to. 
Yeah, because you also made it participative. So you the, yeah. the, the, the visitors, they choose what, how to interact and how to interact with the space and the objects they see and how they... So it's absolutely fantastic, really. And I'm not sure if this kind of things have been done with uh, scientific instruments. Probably, I, I, probably we can have a look at some experiences that other museums have had with virtual reality and the interpretation of at least a function of scientific instruments, particularly early scientific instruments, maybe because they're, they're so complex, uh, right? And they need a map in order to be read uh, and interpreted, I don't know. Did you look into other museums that are having these kind of um, experiences? I mean, if you're looking just at museums, I think some museums have attempted to do so to understand the uses of scientific objects. Um, even this, this very specific type of scientific object, which is obviously like a um, consumable good and a splendid item. Um, and I looked a couple of things at the Met and at the Maritime Museums in Greenwich, and they have either videos or solutions that you can really understand what other object functions. I, th I, I think here is the, um, the challenge is what happens when you have scientific objects in other type of spaces, which are not museums. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sites so, or um, mentioned the palaces, but I also thought about about the archaeological sites because I think they have a similar type of challenge that often they have material uh, mm -hmm. that if you just look very specifically at the object, then you ignore the space. So you always need to to balance everything. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The same almost with the uh, botanical gardens because I was thinking also about this. Now you have the very specific um, specimen uh, that is developed. Yeah. So you're interested in that specimen, that tulip. Mm -hmm. But then mm -hmm. you forget about all the layout. So yeah. how do you keep the two things level? Oh, but I tell we have a fantastic, fantastic app of virtual, re not virtual, augmented reality done by students of the Faculty of Sciences on the Tropical Botanic Garden. So you point at a tree and you see the tree, that tree, in summer, in winter, in uh, and then with birds, and they identify the app, identifies the birds for you. It's a fantastic thing, you know. That's why I think that these kids that are now studying informatics and so on, they know so much, and they are so good, and they're so creative. As long as you just, you know, show them the object, and they will find the solution because they're brilliant, most of them. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think that um, museums, botanic gardens, archaeological sites are really underestimating the power of these digital. We're kind of elitist, you know, we kind of think, ah, that's not the same thing. And it isn't. And it isn't. We have to be careful, huh? No, it but isn't. It's, it's, it's really something that can add to, it can really take you to think mm, thoroughly about about the object because otherwise you can just okay it's very nice and you just keep a very superficial opinion yeah. about the thing yeah and don't forget that people are not used to see things they're not trained to observe things okay they see them they look at them but they're not trained um to anymore also it's a paradox but it's because of the screens and so in a way you are kind of complementing them with information that they could not even be, they, you know, you ask, what's the color of a blackbird, for example? Do you know the color of a blackbird, uh, Bruno? Is it black? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you see, it's this kind of thing. So you're not trained to look at, uh, especially objects in museums, you just pass through them and you kind of, because something attracts you. And especially with scientific instruments of difficult comprehension, like this one, uh, different, dif difficult context, dif different, difficult histories, uh, you can add so much layers of information uh, that um, that you cannot do normally, except if you have a kind of a personal interaction. But that's not possible all the time, right? Last question, I think I have here. Well, it's been so good. Oh my God, there's so many. Wait, let me get, um, let me get Deborah because 
Samuel is agreeing with us. He's saying, yes, the exhibition should help to look at the object. And now Deborah is recommending you to get in touch with Delphine Eisenman. Hello, Delphine. She's also very good. Who was responsible for the project of a recent display of a coronary celestial globe, globe at the University of Strasbourg with augmented reality. Oh my God, I must interview her for, for UMAC maybe for the University Museums and Collections. That's great. So that's a note for you. I'll put you in touch with Delphine. Bruno, if you right. don't know, oh, but Deborah can also do that. And finally, there is a question here from Samuel saying, I remember you, Bruno, you are thinking hard about co-construction of the museum narrative by the visitors and the labels, the museography. How does this dimension come in? How are you taking this into account? You already explained a little bit, but maybe you can explore a bit more. Labels, labels. Um, uh, yeah, I, labels are, are very tricky. And um, I've been thinking lately that uh, we need to find alternatives to labels. I know. Uh, and maybe we don't need the. Um, Maybe if we see labels as a description, as something that I'm going to tell you what this is, so then we definitely need to give up on the labels. But if we see the label as questions, so for example, while I was looking at the globe, another thing that is uh, that perhaps it's very obvious for someone who understands the basics of astronomy, but is where is the Polaris? Where is the the North yeah. Star yeah. in the yeah. object? Yeah. So yeah. if you yeah. just if you just ask this question, where is the North Star in the, this object? Yeah, yeah, yeah That would yeah, be enough yeah. to trigger um, a reflection of what on the uses of the objects, on its purpose, and then it, you you trigger curiosity. Yeah, and then yeah. from there you 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 start looking for the information that you need. Um, so I'm been thinking about this lately, and I think perhaps it's instead of just giving a definition or a label, we should try to look for that either the specific question or the specific image or the, the video or something that you can offer to visitors that triggers the, um, the curiosity uh, path. And then yeah. it just works on its own. Yeah, yeah. No, but I think that the co-creation thing, whereas it, um, it's more common, Samuel, in case of contested objects, you know, and I don't think that this Schisler globe is a contested object, although it certainly has a lot to do with authority and power and empire. But uh, I think that um, uh, when you want visitors participation, um, uh, when you want their contribution is in the, or at least mostly, is when you know that the object has multiple perspectives, cultural dimensions, etc. Say, yeah, but again, this is another problem: is that we think, we tend to think that scientific instruments do not do, you know, are are not prone to contested, being so contested as say human remains or ethnographic object and so on, but they can be actually. Although I don't think that it's the case of this one uh, in terms of, um, but we certainly, we could have a, a discourse about empire with this globe, definitely. And about Euro Europe, uh, don't you think Bruno? Yeah, and uh, it, it really depends what way you're looking at with the object. This exhibition in Moscow that I, I showed at the beginning, it's something that yeah. really made me think about it. This is also part of the object story when it's just yeah. used yeah. as yeah. a tool to create Absolutely. a discourse on empire. Very um, good point, very good point. So you, yeah. you, you also need to see it, okay, maybe it was not created for that, but it's being used with that purpose. Yeah, absolutely, um, absolutely. So you need to be, to think carefully what, what is the, the thing that we're doing with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's exactly what I think is the right approach. And says Samuel, so I think that uh, we're going to, there is no more, I think the, the discussion was great. 
the chat, the questions were very good. Thank you so much, Samuel, Paulo, Katarina, Deborah, and others, because there's more people listening, although they did not ask questions, but I thank you all, you were great. This has been one of the most um, uh, vivid, active uh, seminars that we ever had. And so I'm extremely grateful to Bruno for raising these issues. There would be much more. Uh, but uh, I really wish you all the best to do this, to take, take this forward. Delphine, Strasbourg, also us. I mean, the students of uh, the students who did our app, our app at the Botanical Garden. You can talk to them. You know, they already did their masters, but I mean, you can talk to them. the trouble with the informatics guys is that you. It's very hard to get them after they left the university, because then they become very <laughs> expensive. So you have to really get them at the time when they have to do a masters or a PhD or whatever. Otherwise, bye bye. But, um, but yeah, but uh, we, we should talk about it because um, there are things that I think we can collaborate, even because I have not lost the idea. It's my dream, okay? I have not, I don't know if I will do it, but I have not lost the idea of assembling all the instruments from the royal collections that we know of existence and that are dispersed in the palaces in our museum, in, uh, in Coimbra, uh, in Brazil, get them all together and do a very simple exhibition, not a lot of explanation, but do a lot of, uh, because sometimes people think that the collection that is in Coimbra, 18th century collection, is the royal collection. It is not the royal collection. It's a teaching collection from the Colegio dos Nobres, and then it went to Coimbra. It's, the, it's the, the fault is there of Palia who got some ideas in the mind of the people, but it would be wonderful to get them all together. The Schisler, the, the instruments that we have here, uh, the drawings uh, and so on. And so the more information we have and the more tools we have for interpretation, the better. I want to do that. I think it's gonna be great. Let's hope, let's hope it's going to happen. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe not next year, but yeah, but yeah. Be a nice and a nice uh, turnaround of the things with that big exhibition. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much again, Bruno, for your time and for no, your you. wisdom and knowledge and reflection mm -hmm. for sharing with us, which was absolutely great. And I invite everyone to participate in our next seminar which is going to be about a different thing. Uh, it's always a different thing. Each seminar is unique, but anyway, it's about Coimbra, the University of Coimbra, and the memory of a world center of phonetics with Quintin Lopes from the Institute of Contemporary History of Nova University and, university, and the University of Evora. And it's gonna be with us 24 May, at five o'clock and uh, I hope that you will be here with us too. Thank you so much.